Pigeons 420. Mr. Grow It. And Rob from Cannabis Lifestyle TV. From the Stash Podcast. From the Stash Podcast, we are back again. It's your boy Rob from Cannabis Lifestyle TV, Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and Pigeons 420. Good to see you, boys. What's going on? Ooh, another day. Good to see you. Another, another day, day. Another another blunt for me. But yeah, hey, <laughs> hey. Yeah, yeah, man. You know, another big shout out. Drink for me. I was just gonna Sorry. say, big shout out to the coffee today because I have been dragging behind. I don't know what it is, man, but like it's it's the weather. I think whenever it's cold, I'm really lethargic, and it is. Ugh, I don't even want to talk about the temperature here, man. I can't stand it. It's so cold. I know a lot Go of ahead. people down Let's- south. Let's talk temperatures because I'm at my, uh, minus 52. We had all right, never mind. Yeah, it's not so bad here. Minus no? 52 and freedom. Minus 52, units? No, not freedom <laughs> units. Well, actually, believe it or not, minus 40 degrees Celsius and minus 40 degrees freedom units. They're actually the same. Hmm. They're yeah, actually well, the same. I'm, I'm I don't at know 25 science degrees, works. so I guess I can't complain too bad. But it sucks ass for me because I don't like cold weather and I don't know why my family is even here in this fucking cold ass state i love michigan but man how did we make it here you are very fortunate you know chris you're yeah. obviously doing doing real well 55 degrees i think today and this is a cold day it's yeah, been in the 60s like, for i think most of february so ugh, yeah. sunshine oh. i know we'll wow. have a few people complaining Amazing. about us talking about the time that we're recording this but hey don't watch it don't listen to it then ugh. swipe right <laughs> swipe it off <laughs> so speaking of, you know, environmental things and, and, and temperatures and things like that, you know, a lot of people have recently been talking in the comment section in 420 Growers Club and Cannabis Lifestyle TV about why is my yield not as, as large as it is or why is it not doing as well as it normally does, especially the people who are growing in cold climates who are like, man, normally the winter, I knock it out of the park. What am I doing? What's going on? I'm like, well, it's a lot of variables to that. It's not just a quick answer. It's not just one thing i'm like oh here's what it is turn this on or add this to it or fucking go get big butt some sort of thing no no there's a lot that comes to it and i think one thing right now that i see a lot of people dealing with is the environmental factor depending on where you live certain climates right now are drier than normal are colder than normal are even more humid depending on where you are like it just really depends where that is a huge factor you know depending on what cultivar you have if that environment's not dialed in that's the first first most important thing to me with the garden is if that environment isn't right for growing you're not going to get the yield you're looking for. Environment's number one, in my opinion. Uh, you can have the best nutrients, the best lights, the best skills, but if your environment is off, even just having pots sitting down on um, like concrete and not having them elevated off of anything, a uh, big mistake. You know, you're freezing the asses off these plants. So environment, literally, key, number one. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, talking about like a humidity, VPD, like make sure that the stomata opening is is where it should be, um, you know, not too dry of a, a environment, not too wet of an environment, moist of an environment. Uh, and then temperature, right? Some people running, um, you know, reach out to me like, why is my plant stalled? It's like, well, you're running too low of a temp. So, um, you know, making sure that it's in the ideal range is certainly key. And then kind of getting to CO2, right? CO2 is another thing. Um, if you don't have proper uh, air exchange, um, you know, you could just be depleting your CO2 levels and that could be suffering uh, growth as well. So making sure you have that air exchange, uh, if you're supplementing CO2, uh, environment, environment, those are all things that can contribute to increasing yields. Absolutely. But, it, you know, I would say it's hard for me to say number one or number two at that, because what I always scream constantly is genetics, man. And I, I really say strains now. Thank you, Chris, on that. The cultivar, depending on the cultivar that you have, if it's one that isn't a large producer, man. Like no matter what, I cannot get this headbanger pheno that I particularly have. This particular pheno just does not produce much, man. It's popcorn staircasey buds, unbelievably tasty. I mean, it's so tasty. I could just smoke this. If this was the only brand of herb, period, I wouldn't be mad. Honestly, it's just fucking fire. But yield wise, if it was the only one I could grow, that would be a struggle for me, man. And I think if you start off with a cultivar that's not going to produce real well. It, it's not known for that. It's obviously not going to do that great. So you may need to just get something new. You know, I've had a lot of times where I've popped different strains that are supposed to be the ones or strains, cultivars, you know, ones that were supposed to be heavy yielders. And the phenotype that I got was, you know, mid range and you can manipulate it and do things like we'll talk about later in this episode. But it's not always uh, a factor that 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 cultivar is going to change up. It's not going to do the the big shift of going from popcorn buds to huge colas. I mean, I've super cropped. I've 
low stress drive, any bit of training you can do, and it's no matter what. This particular one just does not push it, man. You guys yeah, got I mean, anything like that? You ever it's, in his, it's in his genotype, right? I mean, genotypes, the, the, the DNA of the plant, the, the possibilities of the actual plant. And then from that, you've got the, the phenotype, right? What the actual um, result is, what the actual characteristics from the genotype is. But yeah, I mean, genetics, if it's not in its genetics, then, um, you know, it could be a, a low yielder, for example. You're not getting blood from a stone, I believe I heard one time. Uh, <laughs> the reality is if it ain't there, you're not going to get it. And I think homework is key. If you, if you, if you know, if yield is something you're particularly um, trying to work on, maybe you've figured out the taste, you've got your, you've got your profiles lined up. Now you're trying to try to get those numbers. You know, if that's something you're you're focused on, homework is key. Homework is key. You know, what cultivar are you going to choose? What you know, is it, is it one known for its abundance? Is it one that's, you know, popcorn lanky, not going to get you there? Homework's key. Yeah, I absolutely agree, man. And you know, I've seen a lot of people who they assume that they can just take any strain. You know, I, back in the day I had this, uh, Holy grail Kush and there was a dude, this Eagle grower that I used to know. And he's like, man, I'll get two pounds off of anything, bro. He used to rock the wing hoods. He'd have CO2 pumping in there. Thousand watt HPSs. Big old basement, tall ceilings. He had 18-gallon plastic totes that he grow these plants in. One plant per 1,000 water. He grew this plant, called me up when it was finished, like cussing at me. Motherfucker, what kind of shit you give me, bro? Just ruined my whole harvest. I'm like, what do you mean? And he was like, man, I got four or five ounces on that whole thing. I'm like, huh? You're mad at me? Motherfucker, <laughs> didn't I tell you? Did, wasn't I very clear when I said, hey, this one does not produce a whole lot. It's super, super tasty does not produce a whole lot it just is is what it is man now so the I've homework seen, was there yeah the homework was there i told him but, but so he thought he ignorance. could push it he's like no dude no i man trust me bro i use house and garden you just need to get to h and g bro it's the nutrients i'm like <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't say it's the brand of nutrients now maybe what you're giving that plant in particular now in his case he was pushing a lot of shooting powder so he would see sometimes a little bit more growth but in my opinion I was just seeing a lot more gangly, fingery, not the look I was after with his bud, but he was getting a little bit more yield. He was pushing it more. But again, not every cultivar did it. This particular one just didn't do much more. It was just a giant plant with a bunch of little popcorn buds. So no matter what you want to do in that situation, I think the best variable would be getting the right cultivar. And if you found the right cultivar, you may still not get the right amount of yield if you're not doing something like plant training. Now you could do starting off with topping. I've seen a, a difference between topping and fimming sometimes can be dramatic. Sometimes just the slow growth or sometimes the rapid growth in between fimming a certain plant. I had a master kush that blew up when I would fim it. I'd get like six tops in a few days. Like they just push it. I'm like, whoa. And then like they wouldn't be full fat tops, but I see where they're growing. I'm like, my God, dude, six, seven days. And I've got new growth. As were before, I've fimmed GDP and that's taken me almost a month to see new growth, you know? So, so topping or fimming or training your plant early on, that's going to be another way to help increase that yield because you'll have more potential colas. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, according to grow weed easy, you get a 40% increase in yield just from doing a training such as low stress training uh, alone, rather than letting that plant grow naturally with its uh, Christmas tree type structure, actually bending those branches down and having multiple colas shoot up all kind of even bud size in there. Um, Apparently, it's a 40% increase in yields just in doing training alone. So that is an excellent way to uh, increase yields. And it's not just low stress training. It's also the high, a combination of high stress training with the topping or the fimming pigeons. I know you do super cropping. That kind of helps you with yields as well, right? Uh, you cannot, <clears throat> I, I, I believe unless you're growing outdoors, you know, I watch some of those Mendo dope bushes, you know, you have those dope boys bushes and I'm shout just out like, to them for killing the game. you know, yeah, huge shout out. Um, I, I, other than that, I, I'm an indoor grower. So the reality is, is if I'm going to exploit or take advantage of numbers, I, I need to train my plant. And, you know, I, I don't even top anymore, to be honest with you. I haven't topped or fimmed in years. It's all bending. It's all bending. Lots of bending from, from go, you know, the moment you've got, you know, you, if you apply science to the equation, which <laughs> I'm not Bro a scientist. Science. Bro, <laughs> Bro. Um, when that when that plant's not trained, that energy is going in one direction. It's going up, and that up is going to the main cola, the stack. And when you train that plant down, now there is not just one single 
cola, you have multiple colas, if you can refer to them as that. And uh, I, I'm a huge proponent of, of training your plants. And I've done some incredible things to plants to make them, you know, you can take something that looks just gangly and odd looking, and you can just bend her down, bend her around, give her the old how do you do, and she's gonna she's gonna produce for you. Um, I had a I had a plant the the new dog, and it did it did just that. I, she was a little bit out of control. I just bent her in half, and then trying to like tied everything down to the pot, and then it just turned into a bunch of beautiful colas. And she was a she was a beauty. You know, train yeah, train dude. train. You have to train. I'm a big yeah. big uh, fan of low stress training as well. I think that that's probably the most sufficient way to go about getting more tops. I'd say on your plant without that lengthier stress in your time like i've had to wait like i said up to three weeks for the new growth when i've had done any sort of cutting or any sort of high stress training on there compared to just bending within a few days you're seeing that curve up and you're like oh these Ouch. little areas now it's like you got a menorah all of a sudden you know yeah and, and low stress training on top of another technique that people do is is adding a trellis net so a lot of people call it scrog net um so having that flat across and, and when you're low stress training um, bending it through. So it, it helps fill up the grow space entirely, right? If you're, uh, you're lighting, you have a certain footprint, a flowering footprint. If you're trying to increase yield, you want to maximize that footprint as much as possible and having a, a trellis net across um, that footprint and then being able to bend down. Um, it also helps support the plant, but uh, bending down and filling up every square inch of that footprint. I mean, that's definitely going to help increase Huge. yields. And, and then one other thing would be to, um, the SOG technique, right? Um, which is basically just growing a bunch of, uh, of small plants uh, with single colas filling up your footprint. Um, and then that's actually a fast way to get uh, a bunch of um, yield, right? Because you're you're spending a shorter amount of time in veg because you've already have your footprints pretty much already full with, with plants with shooting up. So you can uh, flip to flower faster. Um, and yeah, it, filling up that footprint is just kind of a main thing that a lot of people don't do if, and they're chasing after yield. And I'm like, hmm, well, maybe you should probably, that's one of the things you can, should kind of start with. Fill your space. Fill yeah, the space canopy. you've got. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. The screen of green, the scrog, the sea of green. Yeah. Great techniques. Um, in fact, I think you touched on it too with the supporting your plant. Um, that's huge. Now, I, I've, I, I don't, I've never done a, a screen of green, a, a scrog, if you will. Um, but the benefit of doing a scrog is 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 um uh, massive you know the idea that you can create a plant that's you know significantly larger than your pot is is huge you know you you grow in you know try to grow in no less than a 10 gallon when you're going to go that large for myself and to be able to, to to be able to have that much surface area over top of this size of a pot is fantastic i don't use a screen and i do struggle often with trying to balance it out, particularly towards the end of flower, when I'm letting I'm letting it the the pot dry dry out just before harvest a bit, uh, it, you know it can it can kind of it can kind of like flop over. You know you'll come down there one morning and if you've got too many coals to the one side, she falls over. You know and that's that's totally a yeah. You know and there's a, a product called the Web. It's a local guy who made it. It's basically like a, a pre built screen to green th system. But it's got two different layers. So you can grow one plant. It's got a moving tray. So you're sitting your plant on there. It's got wheels on the bottom. And there's also an attachment so you can put a light right on top. So it's like a full all-in-one kind of unit. It's pretty heavy. It's a little pricey. Not my cup of tea. I was going to try it. It didn't really fit in my space. I'm more of somebody who DIY my scrog net or my screen of green. I, the scrog net seems redundant. And screen of green net. But when I put my screen up, um, it's... <laughs> I just usually, got it. Yeah, you know, it's just like I'm saying a lot there. But... Um, it's, I see where the value in that product is, especially if you're in a place where you're limited with numbers. So that's, I think where the argument comes into play of harvest or yield per harvest or yield per plant. You know, if you're limited on your numbers or you're pulling on a perpetual system where you've got anywhere from, let's say one to six to even 12 plants coming out weekly to monthly, your yield is going to vary if you're looking at overall yield versus just the individual plants. So to get more per plant, see a green is not going to be the option that I'd see the best would be it'd be the screen of green then to try to potentially veg longer. That's the downside there. Vegging your plants longer versus a shorter time, more harvest per year versus less harvest per year, comparable amount of weight, but your numbers, if you're trying to stay within your numbers, obviously, you know, anybody knows numbers wise, I'm just going to leave it at that. Stay in your numbers because 
it's a system that depending on where you are, it could ruin your freedom there. So don't don't push it. Trust me. I know too many people who have. But you can also be very, very sufficient with, I mean, even a four plant grow if you got some beasts. I used to pull on average like, you know, 14 to 15 to 16, obviously, you know, a bow per plant when I was running one or two plants per light doing the sea of green or screen of green. Sorry about that. And it was just a totally different experience for me because this was just these giant, huge mondo plants. You could flex hard and be like, look how much I yield per plant. But I vegged for almost six months sometimes, you know, depending on the cultivar. I, it was like a mother plant. Like I just had this gigantic plant. Like one of them I ended up getting nearly two pounds, but it was just garbage butt in my opinion. Like I couldn't fucking stand it as so much. I was like, Ugh. but I pushed it and I had, I was able to get it to the point where I was like, damn, look at this huge, huge plant with no smell or nothing to it. It was more the fact that I vegged it so long. I put so much money into the aspect of my soil, the nutrients, the light, electricity, all these things. My return on investment for that really wasn't, that great well it seemed like i increased my yield was it worth it in the long run or would it be better to do a shorter veg more plants more harvest per you know or more yield per harvest per year instead of doing like a gigantic flex grow now i, I know yeah. your video on on smaller plants why you grow smaller plants chris i that's why i try to grow smaller plants some cultivars don't do that but pigeons with being in canada you still got some big fucking plants like I'm assuming you you keep that comparable thing. You're trying to get the most yield with the limited numbers you're able to have. Yeah, well, I I am a, I'm like I'm a med medical. Oh yeah, yeah, you got user, different. Right? So I have my own limits, and I can grow upwards of thirty ish plants. I've never needed my limits because I utilize the space that I have. You, I, I think it's important to note too that we need to mention if you're chasing yield, you are increasing the amount of time that you're going to be spending growing. You, yes, you're also going to increase the amount of time you're spending in your garden, but this is not a get rich quick scheme. You know, yeah, you are increasing cool. yeah. your veg time. Um, I, I like, I think it's, you know, we, we mentioned if you're trying to battle a plant count, uh, recreational in Canada, you can have four plants. Personally, I think if you utilize those four, I think it's a bullshit number. Apologize my language, but it's like, it, it's arbitrary. It's nonsense. And why it's four. I don't know. I get zero it's in, in Manitoba. Excuse but me, anyways, I think if you played your cards right, you know, you could have, you know, you, you can have a mother plant or at least, you know, a, a one plant that's going to set you up with clones and set you up. And you could really stretch the size of those plants to give you a good comparable harvest. And that's, yeah, that, that would be the number one way I would try to chase uh, yield while managing a plant count. Grow wide, you know, grow those plants wide. Yeah, Get some yeah. training. Only way I think growing tall makes sense is when you got a lot of plants in there. That's it. Yeah, I, I agree with um, vegging your plants for for longer. That's another thing that that a new growers hit me up. They're like, "Why did I get such a small yield?" I'm like, "Well, how long did you veg for?" You know, the, some Six people weeks. are really doing like. I personally, like you had mentioned, I like to grow smaller plants. I no longer really aim for for a yield. I like to let the the phenotypes uh, express the way they want to express, and I usually aim for like a thirty to forty day veg time myself uh now you back in the day I used to go after yield so uh, probably should have had the disclaimer that i no longer really <laughs> chase yeah. after yield as as much as i used to but uh yeah definitely veg time is going to be a huge contributing factor um, some people will hear me hear that i veg for 30 40 days and like that's it i veg for 60 days or 90 days it's because they're trying to manage a, a plant count, for example. So having four plants but vegging them for 60 days, 90 days, so they're bigger is going to certainly lead to a, a bigger yield. Or again, if you've got that cultivar that you really like and it you know, it smokes good and it does produce pretty decently and you don't want to have a bunch of those plants to manage, if you've got like a, a super soil, for example, like I've got a 15-gallon you know, pot for this super soil plant, which that is fucking huge in my garden. Normally, I'm rocking three to five-gallon pots. So the amount of plants that I could put in there, the square footage is taken up. So I've got less plants in that room. So naturally, I'm going to need to grow more, a larger plant. I need that plant to be a little bit larger. So there's there's variables that come into play for me, especially recently. I've gotten these new cultivars that have been popping. Some of them more sativa-like. Some of them a little taller and lankier than I expected. I've got this um, thing called Scooby-Doo. It's Ghost OG crossed with 40D. One of them, out of the pot, maybe this big. Other one, my whole fucking light. Like it's, I thought it was a male. It was so big. I'm like, what is going on? Like, I'm not keeping that one. I don't care how dank it is. It's too big. It takes up too much space. And and the how far the the bud sites are. You know, 
you could do as much as you want want to manipulate those but if you're bringing that light too close you could stress it out i know some people will push like oh well if you're using uh more phosphorus at this point or change up your nutrient regimen at a certain point i guess if you change it up in that sense you may be able to manipulate a little bit more there but i don't want to sacrifice my quality for my quantity i'm, I'm like you know same thing with chris man i'm Used to be a lot more focused on yield back in the day when dispensaries would fuck with me. Now in Michigan, the laws are a little different. So I just smoke. I'm just, you know, I consume. I do consume like I run a dispensary. I smoke a lot. But, you know, I, I have multiple growth spaces. I have multiple patients. So it's a little different. And my, my outlook on things is different than somebody else's. But if you are trying to push that yield, you are trying to get the most out of it. You know, you can influence it in things like your food, how you're, how you're treating that plant. I've noticed the organic side of things. People will be like, oh, man, organic doesn't yield nearly as much as synthetic or mineral based. I, I can't agree with that. I think if you've got the right stuff in your soil, you're feeding it like you need to be. The microbes are fed. Everything's taken care of there. You're still going to yield about as much as you would from the uh, the mineral based unless you're doing something like hydroponic. Now, hydroponic, I have seen people push a little bit more, but you are going to have a quicker veg time. So it's like maybe changing your media, or changing how you feed your plant. That could be one way you manipulate it to get a heavier yield. I, again, I just can't sacrifice my quality for that. Not going to happen. Yeah, it's uh, organic versus synthetic. It's, um, you know, going into nutrition, proper nutrition. Uh, when I first switched to organic, I did see a decrease in yield. Um, but, uh, you know, what I was uh, told by one of my mentors is that uh, it takes time to build up that biology in the soil. You know, it takes time to, you know, you got to inoculate that medium. You got to have the right organic inputs in there, whether it be organic matter or different amendments in there, that's going to have the correct balance for the plant during the different stages of growth. So it might take time if you're doing an organic grow, it might take, you know, two or three runs and, and your plant might get better and better each run because you have those microbes in the soil and you have the correct uh, balance of, of inputs in there as well. So that might be why you had, had heard that from some people saying that it was a, a smaller. Yeah, it's like they do it a side by side. They'll do their first time with organic. You know, it's kind of like a lot of the argument of like just trying uh, an organic mix and seeing a less yield is a lot that people will see when they switch over to, you know, mineral based and be like, oh, I got less flavor. It's like, nah, try it a couple times. You got to figure it out. You got to see what the best recipe for you is, how your plant is reacting to it your routine and schedule, the media, all these different variables, it's totally different. It really is. It's the same, but different. It's just the input and how you go about it and, and the, the patience that you'd have with the system. Like with Coco, when I got an issue, I'm going right, I'm tackling it. When I want to push it or try a new product, I can do it when I feed it. You know, I just got this uh, king crab from, you know, planet, planet, I'm high. <laughs> I must think of planet 13. My stocks aren't going up. I don't know what's going on there, but what plant revolution. Yeah, dude. And stocks have been weird lately, but uh, plant revolution, <laughs> shout out to y'all. Um, and I was able to implement that right away. Now I probably could in my organic mix, but I don't want to interrupt too much of what I'm doing there. Now this is going to be something that's going to help enhance the avail availability of uh, phosphate, which is cool, but it's kind of like a mammoth pea, a little bit more affordable from what I'm gathering, gathering. Um, you can implement that immediately in cocoa or a regular thing with the organic side. Again, it's, you want to change things up a little differently with microbes, put it right in, but I don't know how beneficial in the aspect I've already got so much already in there. I guess more is kind of redundant at a certain point. So pushing one versus the other, I could see the benefit of trying to get more yield. You can push more when you're doing something like cocoa or hydro. It, it's a little different. You can push a little less when you got the media working for you it's going to have to do its thing but over time if that media is working great then obviously it's going to be able to produce better for you and it's going to get the most out of that plant instead of it being you know a little bit lackluster still good terps still good flavonoids but then that the bud structure the yield isn't quite the same yep yeah absolutely um i think important to note too is the uh the size of the pot that you use uh is what's that there's the saying bigger roots bigger fruits um, I, I, I always suffered from under potting my plants. I, I kind of had this idea that a five gallon was the, like the, the, the size to put into flower. And for some that's perfect. A five gallon, if you're not doing any training to your plants, if you're not going for, you know, um, you know, that next size, like I train all of my plants and I try to get no less than at about a, a, a good 10 to a dozen tops, more tops is going to lead to more buds. And these tops have to be on top. They have to be a top. You can't have a top 
at the bottom. It doesn't yeah. work that way. It doesn't work that way. A, a node or a, not a node, sorry, a, a shoot is going to produce something, but it's not going to produce something that's going to be worthy. Uh, it, a, a good even canopy with good solid top. So needless to say, I used to think a five gallon pot was ideal. Now I will not, you know, seven is kind of the minimum, but now it's no less than a 10 gallon pot for, for flour. If, if you're going to train, because you do not want to be in there feeding every single or watering or tending to those every single day i look yeah. at people people are like oh I'm, i have to water twice a day and i'm like oh my god like my anxiety level immediately increases because i'm like i know exactly how that feels i have been there i've had to water twice a day it's like th that the, the foolishness of like a solo cup challenge like you know what i mean it's like why you do that to yourself so stressful. um I know. it's so stressful so got the gromies bigger the pot, growers club doing that too it's like are yeah, they doing it and you know what hey hey it, it it the challenge itself i think is uh pointless <laughs> however it does bring people together you know i've i've participated in a solo cup challenge i made friends who participated in a solo cup challenge i it think it's a waste a of fun, time you know? it's yeah. it, it is what it is you've got something to expend do you man do you do but you, boo -boo. just the reality of tending to your plants every day mult or multiple times a day is just ludicrous to me so bigger pot is going to ensure that you're in there at least once a day well and like also in that sense so I used to grow in 25 gallon pots. I shit you not in the basement and the plants were pretty large, but my issue was I had coffee, you know, coffee straw size roots, thin, 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 thin roots spread all the way out at the end, but they weren't, it wasn't like a solid root system. You know what I'm saying? And in that sense, it's like, think about suck drinking something with the tiniest, tiniest straw. It's like, they weren't even like the fishbone style roots. They were just like, just making it out of the edge, just going as far as they could. I think uh, not getting a root bound plant, obviously, but having a plant that has a very solid developed root system before going into the larger pot is going to make a big also difference, too. If you've got a larger root system, it's not just a larger pot, but that root system needs to be healthy, strong, do its thing. Definitely get some great white in there. Push that plant more in the aspect of roots, because those roots are going to take up most of the everything. <laughs> I mean, do you guys still use do you guys still use plastic pots? Yeah, I got plastic pots. And for yeah, my yeah. my organic yeah. side, I'm using um, cloth pots. But for cocoa, I, like I, I see a huge difference when it comes to fabric pots versus plastic pots. A lot of people and say it too with like the air development. Yeah, with the uh, air pruning, the people, aeration. They swear they're like, you know, I get better yields, better everything. It's like, yeah, I mean, well, it, it's just like it, the the I, I'm trying to remember the the term of of with the root coming out. It, like it gets sheer. Like they they can penetrate through the pot. Air pruning. Thank you. Um, they and they penetrate through the pot, but they they can't go anywhere because then there's light. And, and 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 rather than a, a root that just goes around around and around and around and around in a pot it they don't because they they try to reach yeah, like for the moisture root, like right they're reaching out root. everywhere mm -hmm. and you find like when you pull when after my harvest i pull those roots out it's not a, a, a root ball it's a root mass that that comes out of those pots so yeah i, I would i would definitely consider if uh, you're, you're searching for that yield to consider a fabric pot yeah a lot of people don't know that um, the roots do need oxygen in the root zone as well right so that's what the fabric pots uh, do is it provides that aeration extra aeration down there and yeah some people do get a, a better result on that now now one thing to touch on that i don't want to get too far off topic on the the yield thing but Grass, grassroots fabric pots, uh, well known in the community um, for their fabric pots. They actually have a liner on their inside of their fabric pots now. Um, the reason why, and, and when I was talking to, I think it was Tyler over at Grassroots, he had mentioned that, you know, when it, particularly when in the living soil, um, you need the medium to be moist at all times because you need the, the microbes to be working on breaking down those, that organic matter. So if the uh, grow pot is drying out from all the different sides, it's not natural and you could have microbes be going dormant there. Um, so that's why they added in that fabric piece um, within the actual grow pot. And now there's still aeration on the bottom and, and on the top part of it, but um yeah, just something to keep in mind now when you're growing synthetically. Um, that's a whole different story. But uh, but yeah, I just figured I'd, I'd to add that in there no, as well. No, good, dude. And that's the thing mm -hmm. is people talk about uh, like Octopot. There's a lot of different ones. There's uh, like AirPods. The AirPods, yep. yep. There's a few different brands that they do comparable things realistically. Is they're going to air prune. They're going to get a good amount of oxygen to your, 
the root system. A lot of times what I'll do is I just take the regular plastic pots and I've drilled holes like a motherfucker through them. And the main thing is I've had them for so long. So <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah. Dude. I've got these 25 gallon ones that are just nuts. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. Looking back, I wasn't producing that much. I mean, average when I wouldn't veg the plant for, you know, four or five months to six months, even crazy enough, um, I wouldn't get anywhere near, you know, more than a half pound. So it seems like, yeah, it's a lot. But think about the square footage of that, how much space that's taking up in comparison. I could have put like four or five gallon pots there that could have got me comparable, if not more yield. So that's where, again, looking at yield per plant versus yield per harvest. Those are going to be two different things. Also determining the factor of what the quality versus quantity side of things are to you because you can sacrifice your quality for sure. If you want to get more yield, push it, man. Go and get a supplement to CO2. Use every bit of a pushing formula you can get for, you know, a Big Bud and um, Bud King and all these different brands that will push it to get more yield allegedly or push your phosphorus at a certain point. Do everything you want to do. They may get foxtailing buds. You may have diminished trichomes, terpenes, flavonoids, but your yields will be up. I know people who do that. I know people in the Fortune Growers Club who they'll sacrifice it for the yield because they smoke like that. They're like, bro, I need more. I need a couple pounds. I blow through the shit and I'm at the dispensary. I'm like, all right, man. Well, here's a couple of cultivars. Here's a few different specific strains. Get it, get some sort of critical mass or some sort of larger yielding strain in your grow. That's going to be one, obviously. Push the environment as much as you can. You know, dial in the VPD if you can, the, the leaf surface temperature. Try to get going. People be like, oh, I'm going to do HPSs then. I'm going to rock the HPSs, Thousand Waters. I'm like, all right. Well, again, you're sacrificing other things, but okay, if that's what you want to do, do the lighting there. And then they're like, oh, well, I'm going to make sure I got my buds as big and fat as possible. I'm like, all right, well, you may risk, you know, bud rot there or mildew or other issues. Like there, there's downside sometimes to bigger yields. There, there truly is, honestly. People be like, fuck that. That's stupid. It's like, I think consistent quality yields with a, a fine balance is more what I'm looking for. I'm trying to get in between where I want to be able to produce a good amount of dank bud. And if any, and nobody wants to do that, they've got a problem growing. They're obviously in the wrong, wrong space, wrong, wrong network here. You shouldn't be watching this video or listening. It's crazy. And if you are listening or watching, if you're watching, drop that motherfucking like, hit the like button. I don't know why mm -hmm. I think we got to remind everybody, mm -hmm. but just if you would, please, for anyone who's offended by my, by nudge there but it helps the youtube algorithm right it's gonna right. get more eyes on this video potentially and comments help too it's a form of engagement i think what helps even more is the sharing right so if you know anybody who is uh, could potentially benefit from this information share this with them that actually helps as well yeah yeah because i know a lot of people who are struggling with yield and it's not really a question that you can just answer like i said at the beginning of this podcast with one answer it's a discussion worth video and i think you know we touched on a lot of good points in here we easily could have a second follow-up video on this there's but, one that we need to, before we end it, we got one more thing that we have to talk about. You know that, right? We're going to get crap for not talking about this earlier, which is lighting. We kind of talked a little bit about lighting, but oh, we didn't really yes. go into detail oh, yes. about Let's lighting. Let's get into it. This, is, this <laughs> should be a dedicated episode too, because I keep getting arguments about HPS still being number one. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. So there Let's are going to be people that comment and say, oh, you should mention lighting first before genetics. And, you know, so <laughs> lighting is definitely either number one, number two, number three, whatever you want to argue, uh, importance, right? So... Um, light is the energy that the plants use in order to grow, right? Um, basically what it is, is it's called photons, right? Photons of light. Picture it as your light shining down and it's actually the density. Some people say intensity, um, density of photons that are coming down. Picture it as like raining, right? Raindrops coming down. Um, the higher power you got, uh, basically it's more, uh, the faster it starts to rain, um, so PAR, photosynthetically active radiation, um, there, it's not actually a metric. Some people say, oh, well, you got a thousand PAR or 1500 PAR. What they actually mean is PPFD, uh, photosynthetic photon flux density, which is kind of like a spot check that you can see with a PAR meter, or they might mean uh, PPF, which is uh, photosynthetic photon flux, which is the total light output um, that that light has. So um, when they say a number like this is a par uh, of a thousand par, they're either returning, they're either referring to PPF or PPFD. Um, but having that optimal amount throughout the grow and, and when the plant is younger, it, it just needs less, right? So I usually aim for 200 to 400 PPFD in the seedling stage, clones, mother plants, 
400 to 600 when the plants are in veg, and then 600 to 900 when the plants are in the flowering stage. Now, if I'm supplementing CO2, you can get higher than that. You can get over a thousand uh, par off of that or PPFD uh, that can be hitting your plants. But yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of growers that hit me up and they've got these, you know, half decent blurple lights, I guess I'll say, um, that just isn't performing where it needs to be. They have the wrong light distance, right? So if their light distance isn't correct, they're not getting as much uh, light as they think they need to get, then you could see a slow growth. But yeah, lighting is one of those things that's arguably one of the most important things because if it's not receiving that energy to begin with, well, then it's going to impact just about everything else uh, down the line. Yeah, and that definitely should have been number one, two, or three for sure. <laughs> but that, that's where, it does, like I said, it's a, this is a discussion video. This wasn't pre-scripted out or anything like that, like you might see on some of our other channels. Uh, but that's the key thing is what, this is a subject that is open, and there's a lot to it. You could be like, well, it's this. And then you go and implement that, and you're like, oh, well, I'm still not getting the yield. Well, then it's this. Well, then it's this. Well, then it's this. Like there's so many things. And if you're missing one and the other, you could be missing it all. So it really comes down to hitting all the variables following cannabis lifestyle tv mr grow it and pigeons 420 once he's back on the tube here otherwise at watchdltv.com or soon his own website where we get that going i'm gonna help bum, you get bum. it going dun, dun, I, i'm curious to on, know uh, though what what do you guys do to increase your yield uh, i'm a synthetic grower myself we got an organic grower we got a couple organic growers we got synthetic grow like what do you guys do um you heard it from me i like to train hard i like to feed heavy um, I like to maximize space and, 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 and ensure that my environment promotes maximum, you know, potential. Um, there's one thing I did want to mention is I, I kind of got taken out of context one time when I, when I, when I argued the idea of a gram per watt. Um, I, I, I remember when I was in my novice career or you could, or excuse me, I'm still in my novice career when I, when I was beginning growing and I, I there was a misconception out there that in order to, really consider yourself a successful harvester or, or cultivator, you had to hit that one gram per watt. And I, I think that although one, well, one gram per watt, is like it, it's not unusual these days to see two grams per watt or a gram and a half. Well, yeah, two nowadays, might be a little high, well, but people get yeah, three, anyways. four grams a watt, depending on what kind of light you're using. <laughs> right. Right. You know, um, but, but I, I just want to, I just want to kind of sh throw shade to that because I feel like, it's 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 perpetuated incorrectly. I don't feel like the one gram per watt is a measurable a measure of success in a harvest. I feel like it is a great kind of bar to set for yourself in terms of expectations or maybe some, in terms of a place to, you know, your ultimate goal. But the reality is, is there's so many more things that come into harvesting than yield. There's so many more things that come into, look at the grin on, on Mr. Gross face. Dude, I'm laughing because I literally just released a video recently talking about this gram per watt. And I say almost the same exact stuff that you said. Of, it, and it, I, I think it just comes from just it, it, experience. You know, I don't, I don't care about how much weed a plant gives me. Yes, I want the most out of my grow, but there's just so many more variables that come into play than the one gram per watt. And when I asked in my video, I said, who still tries to achieve that one or believes in the one gram per watt? A lot of people were like, oh, pigeons, you're just giving yourself an excuse because you can't get anything <laughs> off of your plants. You're just not even there yet. And the reality is, is like, no, I got way too much fucking weed. The last thing I need is to is to be focused on something that's just it's an arbitrary number. You know, I want taste. I want I want to have I want potency. I want I want effect. I want to be able to, you know, uh, aid my ailments. You know, that's what I'm looking for. I suffer from ADHD and how much weed I harvest is not going to assist me in my daily abilities whatsoever. No. But I'm curious to know how do you achieve a larger harvest? Well, I think that grand per watt, I mean, it's uh, something that I think was really established back in the HBS days, right? It's like yeah. 600, uh, 600 watt grow light in a four by four. You should be getting 600 grams yield or whatever. But I mean, with LEDs, it's kind of changed a, a bit and you can get a higher grand per watt. But the thing is, it's like, <laughs> am I getting the video is like, what wattage do you use? Do you use a veg wattage. If you're using hundred watts in veg for 30, 40 days, then you switch over to flowering and you're using 300 watts, well, what do you use? Do you use the 300 watts? If you do, then you could be shooting yourself in the foot because you're not using that consistently throughout the grow. 
Um, and then on top of that, like pigeons, you had said is like, there's so many variables to it, right? Environment, nutrition, maxing out your grow space. So you could have a poor gram per watt if you're not maxing out your grow space. And then there's lighting companies that are pitching that to sell their lights. If you buy this light, you're going to get a two point whatever gram per watt. It's like, get <laughs> they just right. jumped on the right. 2008 oh. talk, huh? Uh, right. That's why I have right. a, uh, I have a shirt actually that says gram per watt and there's a huge X through it. Right. Right. I think I've seen that shirt. Yeah. I think I've seen that shirt. It's just, it's an old school thought. And, and, and I, I fell into it. I fell into it. I thought that that's what I had to like a, a strive for in order to post my content on the internet, you know, cause I was a blogger long before I was a, a vlogger, a YouTuber. So it's, you know, it, it was, it was for notoriety, but the truth be told, there's no legitimate, there's no legitimacy to the idea of a one gram per watt being a bar of that means you made it achievement of success yeah yeah Yeah. and i I agree i agree with you pigeons what you had said uh that it it can be used as a personal benchmark right if you if you all your conditions are kind of stable and you only have one variable or whatever you're adding that in then you can definitely use that as a a personal benchmark so i'm not completely trashing that metric at all but you just fucked up my whole like i got six belts that says grand (laughs) lot that i had custom made what the fuck? Oh, this dude? sticker on my back of my I got bumper car. made. This is <laughs> one gram per watt, and I'm at two now. And it's got a check mark beside it. What damn it! Fuck, dude. <laughs> no, no, not not hating on the bro grows, you know. But my main thing is 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 that yield isn't everything. I think that <laughs> focus on more than just that. If you can get the dank strain and you can get the most yield out of that, that's a W in my book. I don't know. So if you guys got anything else to drop, you know, I think uh, in the comment section, obviously we usually try to keep the conversation going. We're live on Thursdays over at twitch.tv slash from the stash podcast. Make sure you check it out. Appreciate, of course, you guys for being here, man. The Gromies uh, in the comment section, in the chat, if we're doing this on the premiere and you guys, you know, Chris, Pigeons, and I'll even say myself too. Rob. Thank you. Rob. Boys, we kick an ass, man. It feels really good. It feels really good. And you know, you guys in the comments are the ones that are making this possible, man. So thank you to each and every single one of you guys that either hit that play button and put us up on the shelf while you're doing your baking or whether you're listening to us in the car or whether you're just chilling in bed while you, we, well, the three of us put you to sleep. Hashtag no shame. You know, hey, we appreciate you. Thank you for listening to From the Stash. Absolutely. With that being said, we will see y'all next week. Peace. Peace.